May 11, 2020, Itaewon, South Korea. A 29-year-old man visits five nightclubs partying with 7,200 people. Five days later, he tests positive for COVID-19, and today over 80 new cases in the country have been linked to this person. Koreans are outraged, and I now have an intro for this video. Clubs are clearly going to be an issue as we recover from this pandemic, and I think that gives us an opportunity to reconsider clubbing altogether. During the pandemic, we've heard about the essentials, groceries, walking, tigers. I want to talk about everything else, what we've deemed the non-essentials. Clubbing is the opposite of what we should be doing during this pandemic. This is not social distancing. This is not practicing good hygiene. And that alcohol should really be going on your hands. So it's no surprise that the nightlife industry is really struggling right now. Lockdown measures around the world mean most clubs won't be open for a while. And sure, many have proposed alternatives, but they aren't exactly great. That's not a rave, that's a traffic jam. The result of all that has been thousands of layoffs and permanent closures. Now I'm sure this is devastating news if you're like 20, but are most of us all that bummed out about this? I mean, when was the last time you were at a club? I looked into this, and it seems like clubs were already in trouble before the pandemic. This is a map of London's nightclubs in 2005, and here are the ones that were closed by 2015. The city has lost half of its original clubs, and a similar story appears to be unfolding in many areas across the world. Clubbing is very much in decline. This was all happening before coronavirus hit the scene, so who's really to blame here? Well, surprise, surprise, it's the millennials. Yup, notorious for ruining institutions such as marriage, doorbells, diamonds, cereal, and napkins, millennials can also proudly take credit for the decline of clubbing. The reasons why are complex. There's the rise of new technology providing cheaper and more convenient alternatives to what clubbing used to provide. For hookups, you can use Tinder or Bumble. If you want to discover new music, there's Spotify or TikTok memes. Then there's the changing economy. Millennials often don't have the same job security and incomes of previous generations, so it's understandable that we might be hesitant to pay $20 for cover and $13 for a Heineken. Finally, some say that young people today are just different. Instead of going out and partying, we're Netflix and chilling and practicing self-care. We've single-handedly created a renaissance in hobbies like gardening, embroidery, and journaling. Could it be that millennials have just gone mild? Well, as a millennial myself, I'm not going to take these comments sitting down. I do plenty of adventurous things. Sometimes I even drink wine while playing Settlers of Catan. So, in my opinion, before we blame young people for the decline of clubbing, I think we should critically examine clubs themselves. Because they've changed. The nightclub used to be way cooler. Many trace the modern nightclub's history to the discotheque of the 60s and 70s. Direct drive turntables like the SL1200 created the role of the DJ, who would mix records for rooms packed with dancers. It was new, flashy, it had that ball, but it was also political, born out of profound social upheaval. It created spaces for gay sexuality and the first generation of post-civil rights black Americans. At the Stonewall Club, a riot against police kicked off decades of LGBT activism. Then in the 80s, the underground rave parties of the US and London injected a new sense of counterculture to clubbing. During the Reagan and Thatcher era, ravers were anti-establishment and grassroots, often organizing shows in empty warehouses. These parties, with the help of new synthesizers like Roland's TR-808 and TB-303, created whole new music scenes. House in Chicago, techno in Detroit, trance in Germany, jungle in black British communities, garage house in New York, and countless other subgenres of EDM. But as we partied our way into the millennium, clubbing became more and more a commercial venture. Nightclubs marketed themselves to a richer clientele, cover charge and drinks became more expensive, and ultimately, these clubs lost their activist grassroots and became much more obsessed with looking exclusive, creating lineups, managing guest lists, and enforcing dress codes. In the process, they ended up all kind of offering the same thing, playing the same music, and dancing the same dances. Researchers Paul Chatterton and Robert Hollins observed this trend in the mid-2000s, noting that in many Western cities, urban nightlife is experiencing a McDonaldization, where big branded names are taking over large parts of downtown areas, leaving consumers with an increasingly standardized experience. While the original clubs might have hosted innovative underground movements that spread new sounds and culture, many clubs today are highly commercial enterprises 
that are increasingly bland and irrelevant. But there's one more side to the story here. Let's talk about TED. No, the Toronto Entertainment District. It was once an industrial area until a decline in Canadian manufacturing left it mostly empty in the 1970s. Then it became ground zero for Toronto's clubbing scene. Cheap lands and rents turned empty warehouses into clubs like GoGo, 23 Hop, Club Max, Limelight, and Crocodile Rock, which then attracted tens of thousands of clubbers on weekends. But in recent years, Toronto's land values have skyrocketed, and TED has become a hotspot for something else, condominiums. Way more people live here now. The population inside TED exploded from under 750 in 1996 to over 35,000 in 2019. What does that look like? Well, this is Crocodile Rock in 2007, and here's what that block looks like today. Many of those new residents really don't like having clubs as neighbors, as they often attract public intoxication, aggressive behavior, and dude bros. In the mid-2000s, noise complaint after noise complaint escalated into an all-out war. Resident groups formed to pressure the government to clamp down on nightclubs and eventually get rid of them. I think this councillor's statement from 2009 sums it up nicely. The quickest way to get rid of a nightclub is to approve a condo that displaces the nightclub. Therefore, you can start to stabilize the district. In the battle of the clubs versus the condos for the heart of Toronto, the clubs lost badly. In the mid-2000s, the Toronto Entertainment District had almost 100 nightclubs. By 2013, that number had fallen to just 30. A similar story has played out in other cities like Berlin, London, Paris, and Sydney. Development, rising rents, and residential opposition are shutting down nightclubs block by block. We need to understand that all that is very much connected to the McDonaldization of the club. Cities are putting a lot of pressure on their nightlife, and the commercialized, exclusive club charging top dollar for cover and drinks is really the only kind of club that can afford to survive. That's a shame, because I think that's robbing us of some of the very best kinds of nightlife. I came across a paper by sociologist Tammy Anderson called Better to Complicate Rather Than Homogenize Urban Nightlife. She writes that you can't group clubbing into one generic concept. Nightlife is really complex and exists on a continuum between large, highly commercial mainstream places and smaller underground and independent spaces. For example, in my city of Vancouver, there's an artist workspace and venue called the Redgate Art Society that hosts shows like Pent Up, a night of two-spirit, queer, people of color, rage, and futurism. Might not be everyone's cup of tea, but that's not the point. These places aren't focused on making as much money as possible. They have a different agenda. I think their website describes it best. If there is to be a cultural scene in Vancouver at all, there needs to be places where young and emerging artists can spend the time it takes to develop their skills and talents, overcome obstacles, and everything else that is required to realize their full potential. I think this is some of the best kinds of nightlife. The kinds that can start new scenes, genres, maybe even movements. But this kind of nightlife is also falling victim to the larger trends impacting nightclubs. The Redgate Art Society was recently evicted from their old building, and they narrowly avoided closing due to rent increases at their current location. So I have a proposal. As we come out of this pandemic, I think we have an opportunity to revisit our nightlife with a lot more intention. Many nightclubs were already on their way out before COVID-19. I don't think we'll miss them. But there are other emerging forms of nightlife that could really use our support, that need us to protect venues, keep rents low, and remind condo residents that they live downtown, not in a national park. I really hope we can do that, because who knows, we might end up sowing the seeds of new movements, new music, or at the very least, a really good party. Love is